The Spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Good evening and welcome to the Spotlight. And thank you for joining us. I'm David Rose. And we begin tonight with breaking news on what may be the most evil drug to hit Seattle since fentanyl. It's called xylazine and it's used to make trank. As I first showed you a little more than a year ago, this dope is deadly. It's an animal tranquilizer mixed with fentanyl, but Narcan won't work on it, and it peels the dead flesh off your bones, leaving you a brainless, zoned-out husk. But the high, that's the killer here. The chemical craving it creates leaves you wanting it even more. And now the cartels have figured out a way to make the zombie drug even scarier. If meth is a dark horse riding side by side with heroin and fentanyl, xylazine is the grim reaper holding the reins. And now the drug traffickers are launching a new deadly marketing campaign. Tonight, Seattle police are issuing a new warning about xylazine. For the first time, detectives say they've discovered it being sold as a standalone drug, not mixed in with others. I talked with Deputy Chief Eric Barden about their concerns. It's a narcotic nightmare. Trank, short for tranquilizer, is the flesh-rotting drug whose base ingredient is xylazine. When mixed with fentanyl and injected, it's a powerful high that turns users into real-life zombies, kills their skin, and leaves them scarred. Now, Seattle police say it's no longer just being laced into other drugs. The cartels are marketing it to addicts in a new way. What kind of form is it being sold in? We've seen it in pill form. The discovery that xylazine is now available as a standalone drug in Seattle is so recent that Deputy Chief Eric Barden couldn't show me what the new Trank pill looks like because the ones they have are part of a very active investigation. Have there been any deaths in Seattle because of this drug? There have been, uh, we know of three uh, deaths so far in 2024 where xylazine has been present. The medical examiner has identified three overdose deaths as having Trank on board. So now, in addition to the threat posed by the death dealing fentanyl pills known as blues, he says patrol officers are on alert for users collapsing from tabs of Trank. If it's a xylazine only overdose, the Narcan would have no effect at all. That's because xylazine is not an opioid. There's no antidote for an overdose. Hey, Seattle Police, wake up. Hi, uh. And it's not just the pills they're on the lookout for. He says they're concerned about it being trafficked in liquid or powder form. Why are the cartels even shipping xylazine here when there's so much fentanyl and so much meth just flooding this area? Xylazine uh, enhances the, the effect of the opioid in, because it, it has similar impacts. As it's a sedative, it, it, it slows the heart, it slows breathing and those kinds of things, but it lasts longer. So if a person is buying fentanyl, and the, it is laced with xylazine, they, they may interpret that as being better fentanyl because the effects last significantly longer, not realizing that it's actually xylazine that's having that impact. One young lady was telling me about it and uh, she was saying that she used it and then was out and didn't remember anything. Drug counselors and health professionals have been on alert here since 2022, as Trank has spread from the east to the west coast. They start dancing and they, they seem kind of happy and they're just having fun to an immediate like zombie like trance. For one recovering addict, the euphoria it produced almost seemed worth it, even though it did this to her arm. It was definitely scary, but then you hit a point where it just becomes normal and it's just another part of getting high. That pull of addiction now even greater on the streets of Seattle with this new triple threat of xylazine, meth and fentanyl all sold separately in the name of profit, smuggled in by the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels. They're not pharmacists creating this stuff. And the dosing in, in each pill or vial or whatever it may be can be wildly different from one dose to the next, which is so extremely dangerous. There's opportunities for treatment and help uh, and, and w we're just hopeful that folks can overcome the, their addiction. And there is help. Suboxone is one of the best available treatments for opioid use. It keeps users from feeling sick and helps with cravings. King County has a new 24-7 hotline to make it easy to get a prescription. Just call 206-289-0287 or email telebup at uw.edu.
Well, now a group of kids with guns terrorized parts of South King County this week. According to police, investigators say the kids are between the ages of 12 and 16. They stole a car at gunpoint and tried to steal another and crashed into a driver. That crime spree started in Tequila and ended in Renton. Investigators say that's where all five suspects ditched that stolen car. Police caught up with them, but investigators tell us this is only the tip of the iceberg for kid criminals in Renton right now. In the last two weeks, police say there have been at least two violent cases involving teens. On March 28th, the group of four teenage Kia boys went on a joyride in a stolen car. Police say they even threatened an 8-year-old and a 10-year-old with a gun. And a few days before, Renton police arrested three 15-year-olds who crashed another stolen car. Megan Black with Renton police says this problem won't be fixed by just making arrests. This is not a law enforcement alone issue. This is a community issue, and we really need to put our money where our mouths are, right? Because we need to get some help to these kids, but they also need to be held accountable. Well, despite the crash and the stolen cars, no reports of any serious injuries. When they appeared in court this week, the judge released two of them on electronic home monitoring. An Everett mom charged with murder, accused of stabbing her four-year-old son more than a dozen times, killing him. And now a state lawmaker claims Ariel Garcia's death could have been prevented. Representative Travis Kocher says the Keep Families Together Act makes it easier for parents who have drug abuse issues to actually keep custody of a child, putting him in danger. The goal of the law is to decrease the separation of parents and children. It requires a social worker or a police officer to prove imminent physical harm to a child exists before they can be removed from a home. Representative Couture says one solution involves changing the law to add hard drug abuse to that list. Spotlight's Jennifer Dowling here with the details. The search for Ariel Garcia ended in tragedy. His mother now behind bars accused of stabbing him around 16 times. Ms. Garcia is present in custody unrestrained. Detectives say his grandmother had been trying to get custody of the four-year-old telling court officials in this audio recording her daughter had been using drugs. The allegations are that the mother is currently using, you said drugs? Yes, and alcohol. This order says that the children are to be with you. Representative Travis Couture believes stronger child protection laws might have helped Ariel. We don't want instances like uh, what we saw with this case with uh, little Ariel where you know, he's murdered, he's dumped like garbage on the side of I-5, like his life didn't matter. Couture feels the problem started in 2021 when the legislature passed the Keeping Families Together Act, or House Bill 1227, making it more difficult for DCYF to remove juveniles from a home if the parents are addicted to drugs. The goal was to keep families together and reduce racial injustice. The law now states the child needs to be at risk of imminent physical harm before caseworkers get involved. So Couture proposed a rebuttable presumption bill that would have classified hard drug abuse as imminent harm while allowing allowing parents to respond in court. What we would have been able to do is more easily remove kids from those dangerous situations. Instead, he says lawmakers passed a watered down bill that only addressed fentanyl. And what that bill did is uh, only for fentanyl and nothing else, no other drugs. He says his bill might have also helped with an intervention in the case of Jordan Sorensen, a Port Townsend man who admitted that he hid his infant's body in the bushes in January. Couture says the deaths of children like Ariel could continue to rise without changes. The mother was had been involved with CPS before, was known to have used drugs. Uh, had something like my bill been in place, that death might have been prevented. Couture says the state averaged around four to five child deaths a year a couple years ago due to drugs, but in 2022, he said the numbers skyrocketed to around 85 confirmed cases and more than 16 near deaths. Couture says he plans to work on legislation before the next session to once again try to strengthen child protection laws he could pre-file in December. I'm so angry that, you know, she lost her life and somebody hasn't come forward. Tonight, troopers are still searching for the driver who hit 30-year-old Taylor Drewliner while she was crossing the street in Linwood last month. Her mom posted on social media last weekend saying Taylor passed away surrounded by her family. She was an organ donor who helped five other people in need. The crash happened on Highway 99 on the night of March 19th near the Safeway and Bartell Drugs. Here's the car. Troopers need your help to find it. It's described as a dark-colored sedan, possibly a Toyota Corolla. 
Taylor's mother had this message for the person behind the wheel. Come forward. I mean, you, you killed somebody. I mean, if that's not enough, it's one thing to, to harm somebody, I think, but to take somebody's life, I mean, that's just, I, I don't understand how, how somebody can be okay with that. So take one more look at that car. If you have any information on where it is or who drives it, you are urged to contact WSP or Crime Stoppers. He was on the run for more than a month, accused of brutally attacking and stabbing a woman on a trail in Tacoma in broad daylight. But investigators say police finally arrested Nicholas Fitzgerald Matthew from Federal Way down in California. Court documents say he was caught attempting to flee the country. Pierce County prosecutors have charged the 27-year-old with attempted murder. Investigators allege Matthew drove to Point Defiance Park and stabbed the woman in an unprovoked attack back in February. One of his neighbors shared how they heard intense violent threats from Matthew before. One day he was yelling at the top of his lungs, talking about, I'll murder you. You don't know me. I thought he was just an angry guy. Well, detectives used this sketch and evidence from the survivor's jeans and shoes to identify Matthew. Inside his Federal Way apartment, investigators say they found a hoodie with dried blood and two knives like the ones used in the stabbing. Matthew is currently being held in California without bail. New images of a security guard accused of facilitating a beating that left a teen badly injured, a beatdown that was so concerning to other inmates, they told investigators they wanted to be transferred. The woman right there you see on your screen is now facing multiple criminal charges. And perhaps the most shocking revelation the Spotlight investigative team has learned is it took almost two weeks for anybody to report that beating. Our Matthew Smith has the latest in our ongoing investigation into Green Hill School. So far, we've only seen security images, no video. In fact, the state wanted to block us from getting a number of videos of events that took place inside of Green Hill. And the question is, what don't they want us, or more importantly, you to see taking place inside this facility? And why is it that detectives investigating this case actually question the information that was being handed over by the man running Green Hill? I think people are just scared to speak up. Past employees have called this place dangerous, concerning, even toxic. It's such a great opportunity and program for these youth um, if it was ran differently. For months, Fox 13 has put a bright spotlight on this Lewis County detention facility, showing our viewers what takes place behind the barbed wire fence of Green Hill. This place is supposed to rehab teens and young adults that committed crimes at a young age. That's a lot of stuff. Stuff. Green Hill first came under fire after police raided the state-run facility after they failed to report dozens of drug crimes. Now, our reporting found additional issues with security that allowed a flood of fentanyl to make it inside. In another instance, an employee who walked weed gummies right in the front door, only to put the drugs in a reward locker for residents. But most recently, it wasn't drugs, but a guard, Michelle Goodman, who made headlines after she was arrested for turning a blind eye when an inmate was assaulted on her watch. In a newly uncovered report, a detective went even further, stating he, quote, found it evident that Miss Goodman was not only aware of the situation, but also facilitated it. Still images obtained by Fox 13 show Goodman laughing right after the fight. The inmate's not shown due to his age, but documents describe that he was mimicking the punches thrown. A nurse who treated the victim told detectives the inmate's injuries were obvious and documented multiple times. But when asked for records by detectives, Green Hill's superintendent said he didn't have evidence, photos, or incident reports. He said they were unaware of the assault until January 16th. That's more than two weeks after the teen inmate was beaten. But we know from the investigation that a nurse noticed that bruising more than a week earlier, back on the 7th. Asked about the timeline and why they didn't report the incident to police, DCYF offered a statement reading in part, we did not immediately refer this incident to law enforcement because it did not rise to the level of law enforcement referral. But this wasn't some run-of-the-mill situation. One worker told investigators he believed the resident would have been killed if not for a psychologist that stepped in and moved him to a different location within Green Hill. 
DCYF says they've made surveillance and safety upgrades. But despite investigators' belief that Goodman helped facilitate the beatdown of a resident, DCYF seemed to put the onus on the victim, saying, quote, the delay in the knowledge of the assault is because the resident did not report the fight. But we also know that staff dismissed concerns. When a nurse asked about the attacks, one male guard said it never happened. A second simply shook his head. That nurse even described to detectives that there's a culture where staff are discouraged from reporting incidents. Well, we, are, we need to make more changes at Green Hill. We've been pressing the governor's office for answers as to why he continues to have faith in DCYF as more and more of these issues pop up. After denying an interview, then ignoring our follow-up request, we tracked the governor down and asked him questions at a public event. Even then, he admitted that past legislation that he signed into law was part of the issue. We have now put 23, 24, and 25-year-olds in the same place with young kids. We've never done this before. This is creating new challenges in security, and I think you're going to see a discussion of that in the months to come. But not all of the issues have been about the residents themselves. Investigatory notes from Chehalis police even questioned Green Hill Superintendent Jason Aldana during the Goodman investigation. They called the documentation that he provided to them incomplete, noting he sent just two of 11 pages worth of medical records and said there were no photos of the victim's injuries, despite other employees saying there were. Past employees, politicians, even current workers have all explained to us that this is so important to get everything right inside of Green Hill, because if they fail their mission, they're failing to rehab these young people. That affects all of us because eventually one day they'll likely be back with us in society, but also for these kids themselves, these teenagers, if they want to get better, they deserve the chance. Okay, so here's what you need to do. I literally here's came what you in need here to do. for here's my your prescription. Options. Here are your choices. And you guys are here are your choices. Here are a security guard in Seattle caught on camera cornering a shopper. People online outraged, asking why he was so heavily armed and saying he seemed to be on a power trip. Loss prevention officers will tell you that in places like downtown Seattle, wearing tactical looking gear can serve as a visual deterrent to thieves. But as Lauren Donovan reports, that woman says the guard went too far. This guy thinks I'm stealing. You got items on you and I need those items back. He had guns on him. He had mace. He was calling me a thief and antagonizing me. It was terrifying. I'm just going to look. You go ahead and you open it up yourself. I'm, I'm not clarifying anything for you. Did you steal anything? No. I don't even think I looked around. This is Mika Prince, the woman who pressed record last Wednesday inside the Walgreens downtown on Pike. Uh, he was approaching me, getting extremely close to me, uncomfortably close, said he was going to put me in handcuffs. Prince says this security guard, identified as Brian Vinegar, confronted and then cornered her just before 6 o'clock. Call them, please. I'm giving you every option. To Here, do right I'll thing. sit down while you call them. An official police report shows it was indeed Mika who called 911. Adamant with authorities, she didn't put anything in her pockets. She was just there to get her medication. Mika was rolling as SPD interviewed her and in the process captured a blatant lie on camera. He said that he was going to put me in cuffs and take me down to the ground. Do I don't know who this man is. Stop walking away. Or what? You're going to get detained and you're going to go to the ground. And you're going to get it's sued. Okay. Oh. Mika kept good on that promise, hiring attorney James Prescott, they're now taking legal action against Walgreens. This is just bullying, plain and simple. It's also assault. And when we have large men basically playing cosplay military, intimidating young women, we've gone too far. Okay, let's pause this for a second and break down what's on him. I see two magazines, a pistol, there's a taser, he's got cuffs as well, and not one, but two body cameras. Is all that really necessary for working inside a Walgreens? He's got a much more tactical appearance than he probably needs working in retail. So you're saying it's a bit much for a Walgreens? I would say yes. Looking for an unbiased reaction to this viral video, we turn to Max Anderson, who spent the past two decades working in private security. Um, looking at his uniform, you know, he's wearing a tactical vest. Um, I've worn those at times when I've worked in, um, like, disaster response. Max says what he witnessed was the opposite of de-escalation. He thinks guards like Vinegar give his profession a bad name. It's bad for the industry as a whole um, because it portrays the private security industry as, like, you know, these aggressive, over-the-top wannabe cops that 
um, are abusing their power. Here's what you need to do. I literally Here's came in here for Here's my your prescription. Options. Here are your choices. And you guys are, are your choices. accusing here are me your of choices. stealing. We reached out to Walgreens. They responded with just a single sentence, acknowledging the incident and confirming their, quote, investigating. Well, this next story will show you why security is needed. A Walgreens employee in Graham is lucky to be alive. Jordan Biswell was attacked on March 30th when the suspect asked him to call a cab for him. When he said there were no cabs in the area, a struggle ensued that resulted in Biswell getting stabbed. Deputies arrested that suspect, James Kelly, for attempted murder in the second degree. He was ordered to have a mental evaluation. And despite his desire for justice, Jordan says he's focused on the support from the community. I'm grateful for everybody involved and even the people who are just on the internet um, sharing the story and, and wishing you know positive prayers in my direction. That gives me more hope than I feel like he was able to take away from me. He is a rare soul. He says it will take him about eight more weeks to heal from those injuries. Doctors say he may need more reconstructive surgery in the future. So we put a link to his GoFundMe on our website. Just look for this story at fox13seattle.com. But finally today, to disguise you probably haven't seen before, a Sacramento homeowner says he got a notification that his package had been delivered, was confused when it wasn't at his doorstep. When he pulled up the security footage, he found this thief disguised as a trash bag, slowly shuffling up to the door and stealing the package. The homeowner said he was upset at first because he really needed the phone charger he ordered, but said he couldn't help but laugh at the trashy criminal because of how ridiculous it was. In fact, he doesn't even care if the cops bag him. Well, that's all the time we have on this edition of The Spotlight. Until next time, be smart and stay safe.